Are you ready? Colorado, during tonight's presidential debate at any given time, there's going to be a one in five chance we're going to hear something about Colorado. Former Governor John Hickenlooper and Senator Michael Bennett will be among the 10 Democratic candidates that are going to be on stage. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger doing some research. He's live in Miami and Marshall. So you were trying to find out if where Hickenlooper and Bennett are standing tonight is really going to determine how much attention they're going to get. We know that they're in tonight's debate because of a random draw that has them with some big names. But what was not random is where they're going to be positioned among the 10 people on stage. That's based on polling. And because they have, uh, they're have they lower in the polls compared to the others on stage tonight, they're going to be on the outside, second from the end. So we did a little research experiment to find out if that means less attention. Miami involves a lot of getting noticed, being seen on the beach, making a splash in the water. So the candidates for president. And standing out on the debate stage. We're in Miami at Miami Beach. So why are we at the beach? I feel a little creepy. Because me and photojournalist Ann Herbs had a silly idea. Is it because of us that you're leaving? Go to the place where everyone assumes we go on a work trip and actually work there. I'm a reporter from a Denver TV station. Could I bug the three of you to join the seven of them? Oh, do you mind coming over real quick? <laughs> yes. It's a social experiment. Very nice, very nice. Line 10 people up side by side. This is a little weird, yes. <laughs> just like they'll be on the debate stage tonight. I do feel bad for the people on the end, just because camera-wise, they don't really get much attention. When you're watching at home, you don't see all 10 candidates at once. By the way, I'm the one talking. You didn't notice me because I'm second from the left, not dead center. I'm standing where former Governor John Hickenlooper will stand, second from the left. Senator Michael Bennett will be second from the right. I, I would have preferred that to be a random selection, but I don't think that's a particular advantage. We're all going to be on the stage with the chance to interact with one another. And Do you think they're going to be given a fair shot? compared to the people in the middle? No, Why? just because they're on the outside. Why are we asking this question? Well, last night, Cory Booker spoke for almost 11 minutes. That's double Jay Inslee, who stood where Bennett will stand tonight. Well, I think naturally we kind of look for center, but then we want to look for someone who we know, someone who we feel comfortable in, and someone who's going to be very um, confident in the way that they speak. Thank you. Take it from these beachgoers and a random reporter. <laughs> we know how to stand out in a crowd. Now, not of a lot of it is the control of the candidate, but we'll find out tonight if the moderators learned anything from the math from last night. Will they give more attention to those standing on the outside? Anusha, real quickly, do you remember my adoring fan from yesterday who accidentally walked behind our shot while we were recording and she gave that look? Uh, about 10 minutes ago, I met Marta oh from the AP. And she didn't even know what had just happened, uh, but she was uh, thankful to find out that we thought it was funny. <laughs> hey, at least this time she's smiling and not looking totally appalled. Hey, real quick though, Marshall, what do you think are things that uh, Bennett and Hickenlooper will have to do to stand out tonight? Well, I asked Michael Bennett if he has to have a Ted Cruz moment, you know, blowing up at, at the Texas Senator like he did on the Senate floor. Would he have to do that here? He Oh man, mic drop there. We just lost Marshall all the way from Miami. Anyway, well, you got the gist of the important stuff uh, of what he was talking about. So whether you were watching the first night of the debate or not, it is not hard to guess that the big topics that were getting a lot of attention, right? They were immigration, women's rights, and affordable health care. If we could guess, we're gonna get round two of that tonight as well. Let's take a look at how the numbers are stacking up in Colorado. We'll start with health care because that's a topic that impacts everyone. 2018 data from the Colorado Health Institute shows about 49% of people get their insurance through their employer. 35% have public insurance like Medicaid or Medicare. Only 8% go through the state-run exchange and the last 6% are uninsured. On average, it's costing a single person between three dollars and $5,000 a year for coverage, more than double that for families. 
Colorado was the first state to pass a law lifting restrictions on abortions in 1967, but 87% of counties here do not have abortion providers. Only 8% go through the state-run exchange or buy it on their own. Private insurance companies are not required to cover abortions, and state employees' insurance will only cover them to save a woman's life. There was a bill introduced in the legislature that would have made abortions a felony. It failed in the Democratic-controlled House. When it comes to immigration, the Pew Research Center is estimating there are anywhere from 165 to 195,000 people living in Colorado illegally in 2017. Those were the most recent numbers we could find. During that year, the state's population was roughly 5.6 million. Domestic violence is life-changing, terrifying, and very dangerous. But some victims have started reaching out to local organizations for help instead of calling the police. The group Latina Safe House told our Sonia Gutierrez it's out of fear of ICE and deportation. Everything seemed fine at the beginning. Until she says he started isolating, humiliating and beating her. She lived through this for close to six years, never reporting it because of fear. Fear of him fear of the police, and fear of deportation. Solo me iba a Until one day, de mis hijos. she says he beat her in front of her kids, and she finally made that call. Ya no más. To Angela Caseña in Latina Safe House. The number of resources that they have has actually gone down. Caseña says there were two main policy changes last year that made reporting harder for immigrants. Uh, one of them had to do with asylum seekers and domestic violence. The other had to do with U visas, the program that allows victims of domestic violence to stay in the country with legal status. But now, if they apply and it gets denied, they could be deported. We can all do better. Caseña has received cases upon cases of battered women too afraid to drive because they might get pulled over, afraid of calling anyone in uniform, especially police. But the organization says these women need to know police are a resource too. We don't want anybody to be scared to call us. Sergeant Troy Biscard with Denver Police Domestic Violence Unit also wants to set the record straight. We will not check the immigration status of anyone. Something a survivor of six years of domestic violence wishes she would have heard a lot sooner. They're not alone, you know, usted no está sola, and I want them to know that we are here for them. Caseña tells me there have been women who come to her saying they have been told machismo and domestic violence is a part of our culture. Let me just say it loud and clear right here. In no culture should domestic violence be justified or tolerated. None. I couldn't, couldn't have said it better myself. And Sonia, I think it's important you said to point out that this has been going up is what you've been hearing. That's exactly right. So Latina Safe House says that so far this year, they've seen more women and children than all of last year combined. So that's very telling. All right. Thank you for that. I appreciate it, Sonia. Mm -hmm. Well, the legal back and forth is continuing over the red flag law. State officials have now filed a motion to dismiss a lawsuit against the state. Pro-gun rights organization Rocky Mountain Gun Owners filed that lawsuit against the governor and the state legislature last month. It's accusing Democrats of acting illegally and unconstitutionally to pass the gun control measure. The motion filed today claims that no one in the group was hurt, so this dispute should not be in district court. They're also arguing the complaint was filed as the legislature ended without giving time to resolve the alleged issue. If you were on I-25 after 8 o'clock last night, there's a chance that you saw some cars slowing down, but it wasn't because of a crash or construction. It slowed down for a soldier finally coming home. The procession was in honor of a World War II veteran who will be laid to rest in Laramie, Wyoming. Katie Eastman and photojournalist Darren Rohde tells his story. Pride in family. Wilbur, relax. <coughs> it comes in all forms, and even the badly behaved get a photo on the shelf. You guys want to go outside? Brittany Gerard is proud of her family members, the ones she sees every day and the one so, she's never met. I don't know much about Uncle George, is what everybody is calling him. There's no picture of her great uncle, just the story of how he died when he was 32. Um, he was a sailor on the battleship USS Oklahoma, which was hit by several torpedoes during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. 
She knows his name is George Hansen and that she shares his DNA. Just a cotton swab, just stuck it in your mouth, swabbed it and put it in a container and sent it back. Brittany's dad, Bob, never found a photo either. I tried and I emailed people and called people, but. But he did find George. The one that's coming towards us? Yep. Yep, that's it. It took seven years for the Defense Department to match his DNA with Uncle George's remains, but his family had already waited 70. But then after a couple of years, I just figured, you know, it's never going to happen. And then, and then we got the call. The December call said Uncle George was accounted for in a cemetery for unidentified soldiers in Hawaii. Wednesday's flight brought him back where he belongs. I'm really honored and privileged, and I'm really proud of, of our government, you know, by living up to their motto that we will never leave anybody behind. And it is yeah. my honor to bring him home after 77 and a half. Yeah, isn't that something? Home to a family that has never seen his face. Pretty impressive. They don't need a picture to be proud. What can you say? I'm proud to be an American. No shelf will fit this feeling. Wow. <laughs> this is Prime. For next, with photojournalist Darren Rohde, I'm Katie Eastman. Uncle George will be laid to rest for the final time on Saturday morning in the same cemetery where his family is buried in Laramie, Wyoming. It's a motel that existed before the word motel did. It was just a place to lay your head and be uh, protected from the elements. To see it, you have to head to Grand Lake. The run for the White House is not the first time Hickenlooper and Bennett have faced off. They raced each other on foot. That's next.
Welcome back. I'm Kathy Sabin and you know what? It was another warm summer day with temperatures back in the 90s. Our high of 93 is above average, but not quite near the record of 105 for the date. And with high pressure anchored where it is, it's allowing in just enough moisture for isolated gusty storms tonight. We don't have a lot of punch to them, but we're seeing some stronger activity in southeastern Colorado. Storms are moving really quickly from the southwest to the northeast, and there are a couple around the metro area with wind lightning and kind of what feels like little mini water balloons when the raindrops come out of these clouds. They're not severe and they'll be short lived. This activity moving out tonight with clear skies and light winds. Another warm, dry day coming up tomorrow with a little moisture for a few thunder showers in the southern mountains on Friday afternoon. Partly cloudy 61 tonight. A brief shower, a rumble of thunder early and then clearing back to the hot highs in the 90s. We get you into a warm weekend with a few thunder showers coming in late Sunday into Monday. A better chance of rain from storms and a cooling trend as we kick off next week. Keep those weather pictures coming. This one from Bob Russell Anusha is just beautiful. All right, that certainly is. Thank you very much, Kathy. On this throwback Thursday, let's go ahead and head back 14 years when Senator Michael Bennett and former Governor John Hickenlooper were running a different kind of race. The Denver Public Library shared this photo of Bennett and Hickenlooper running a race through the water fountain behind the Museum of Nature and Science. They had to outrun the kids right behind them. Happened after a news conference in July of 2005. Hickenlooper was the Denver mayor back then and Bennett was the Denver Public Schools superintendent at the time. So Hickenlooper and Bennett are well known here in Colorado, right? But on the debate stage tonight, they're going to be a part of the who is this guy group of candidates. Hickenlooper dealt with that before he even made it into the auditorium. An NPR reporter tweeted that a security officer asked the presidential hopeful if he was there to pick up press credentials, and he had to explain that he is actually a candidate. OK, before you cringe too much at that, 90s political analyst James Mejia thinks that being one of the lesser known people could actually be a positive play for the Colorado candidates. You know, it, it will be interesting to see if either candidate can make fun of themselves a little bit, maybe be a, a little bit self deprecating and say, well, you don't know me, but I've been working on foreign policy issues as a U.S. Senator for some time, or you don't know me, but I've been leading one of the greatest states in the country for, for quite some time. Hopefully there's a little bit of humor uh, to, to being one of the unknown and perhaps they can play that to their advantage against four of the five leading candidates that they're going to be on the debate stage with. OK, night two of NBC's Democratic debates begins in about 45 minutes at seven o'clock. There's an old motel in Colorado that has a lot of history within its walls. This is the beginning of motels. We believe that the Cottage Court is the precursor to what became a motel. We're going to be taking a trip to Grand Lake next.
If there was a competition for world's oldest standing motel, oh, we would win it. It requires a road trip to Grand Lake, and it just happens to be road trip season. So we paid a visit to the Smith Eslick Cottage Camp, built before the Ward Motel was even used. And now local history buffs want to turn it into a one-of-a-kind museum. Today, we think nothing of hopping in a car, and we know that there will be a motel somewhere that we can spend the night. In the early days, that wasn't quite so certain. This is the beginning of motels. We believe that the Cottage Court is the precursor to what became a motel. My name is Jim Cervenka. I'm the president of the Grand Lake Area Historical Society, and we are sitting at the Smith Eslick Cottage Court, which is believed to be the oldest original condition cottage court in the United States. Well, I'm standing inside one of the four carports, so this is where the family automobile would be parked overnight. The 14 foot by 14 foot dwelling unit here uh, would probably not suffice for most of today's travelers. There is no evidence of cottage court in original condition or even any condition prior to our 1915 cottage court. People, as they walk by, they're looking at this and they're saying, wow, this is something in Grand Lake, and Grand Lake has national significance because of this structure. We're kind of proud to be part of that element of the nation's history. All right, so the word cottage was used in 1925, so the cottage court predates it, which is kind of cool. It's got four cabins. It was opened in 1915. That was the same year the Rocky Mountain National Park was established. For now, visitors, you can go ahead and see it for free. They just need to call ahead to go inside. It's a sign that made an next viewer laugh, but in all honesty, it really does have a serious message. That's next.
It's a sign that you need to protect your cars from bears or just give them the keys to park it. Jessica Trowbridge spotted this sign just outside the Fall River entrance to Rocky Mountain National Park. Said she can't decide if someone's trying to warn tourists or the bears are just moonlighting as valets. We are positive it is a warning, but Jessica, we like your humor. Share the signs you see using the hashtag HeyNext or send them to next at 9news.com. Robert wrote in saying, hey, he really liked Marshall's piece. He's the only one that can get to the beach and talk about politics at the same time. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next time.